Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Earthquakes. This sound is one that was taken from the bottom of the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest point in the Mariana Trench. In fact, it was the first ever sound recording to be taken from the bottom of the Challenger Deep, so it is a pretty cool scientific advancement as well as a terrifying sound. Despite the crushing pressures and the fact that there's no sunlight, the Challenger Deep is actually pretty noisy, and that is because of the fact that sound travels a really long way underwater, which ends up kind of turning the Challenger Deep into a sort of echo chamber of oceanic sounds. So while the recording was able to pick up things like the sound of a boat almost 11 kilometers overhead and the sound of whale calls, they were also able to pick up the sound of a magnitude 5 earthquake rumbling near Guam on July 16th, 2015. Number 9. Mantis Shrimp A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, a little green man said size matters not. A shrimp heard this in the ocean and took it to the next level. The mantis shrimp may look like a colorful, fun sea creature, but in actuality is a cold hearted menace of the seas. The mantis shrimp has the fastest punch in the animal kingdom. It can cause some serious damage. As if that weren't enough, the design comes in two different models. Nice. The aforementioned Mike Tyson mantis shrimp that punches its way out of Neptune's depths, and the spear wielding model, because why have one freakishly weird super weapon when you can have two? What's also crazy about this is that the punch of the mantis shrimp is so powerful it can be heard underwater. It may not sound like much, but it can leave a nasty wound. In our number 8 spot today we have ships. It is absolutely not surprising that part of the sound heard in the ocean is ships as they propel through the waters, but what is surprising is just how deep in the oceans these sounds can actually be heard. This sound is another one that was caught in the Challenger Deep on a hydrophone that sits 10,971 meters or 6.71 miles below the ocean. The hydrophone was located at a point close to a shipping center, so much of the sound caught on the mic was the sound of propellers as ships came to and fro to deliver all the goods. Where the hydrophone is located is so deep in the ocean that just to get the hydrophone down there, it took six hours. Although it was encased in titanium, researchers were worried that the unbelievably immense pressure of the deep sea would crack it. Scientists were expecting for this area of the ocean to actually be relatively quiet, so they were in for quite a surprise when they discovered the near constant sound that can actually be heard. Number 7. The Bloop The sound of an air bubble rising in deep water shouldn't be that terrifying, but audio recorded in 1997 begs to differ. Probably the most famous underwater sound ever recorded. I'll let you guys in on a little secret. Deep water that you can't see the bottom of? I'm not a supporter. Most people have fears of the Megalodon or Jaws, and that's fair. I get that. Makes sense. However, deep down inside my soul, I think you guys can agree with me that there are for sure some awful creatures hiding in the deep blue sea. So, what made the innocent sounding bloop? Well, it was probably something that breathed. And if it's down there and it breathes, I don't want to meet it. Given that sound travels faster underwater and is louder, is evidence enough to have me staying on dry land? Be careful out there, folks. You never know what's out there. In our number 6 spot today, we have underwater knocking. This knocking sound was picked up by an underwater hydrophone, and for a while it had people stumped until they were able to find the culprit. Before we talk about what the sound is coming from, imagine being in the deep, dark, icy waters and hearing it. It is straight up out of a horror movie, but as it turns out, the real source isn't quite as scary. This is actually the sound of a species of haddock fish. These types of haddock are a ray finned fish that can be found in the North Atlantic Ocean. The males of this species will produce this drumming or pulsating sound in order to attract mates during the mating season. Outside of the mating season, a similar sound is also produced produced and that is known to be used during aggressive encounters with other male fish. Number 5. Julia. Scary. Another unidentified sound coming from the most comforting place on earth. The ocean. Not really. Give it a name because it wasn't creepy enough as is. Back in 1999, a sound was recorded. It was heard across the entire Pacific Ocean, which in case you didn't know, it's huge. That means Julia is a big girl. Not sure what kind of big girl she is. It could be a giant iceberg breaking off because, um, you know, global warming, volcanic activity. I mean, that's got to be loud, right? Or maybe it's a sea monster the size of a small European country. Oh no, that's not good. This could be how it starts: the ruination. We start hearing large and loud sounds from the ocean, and the next thing you know, bada bing, bada boom, it's the apocalypse. 
In our number four spot today, we have the sigh whale. I don't know if that's how you say it, but here we are. Here we go again with another sound that truly doesn't seem like it should be the sound coming out of any living creature, but hey, in the sea, the rules are just different and everything's a little weirder. These whales can be found in subtropical, temperate, and subpolar waters around the world. They are sadly a species that has seen their numbers decrease rapidly, especially due to the historical commercial whaling that took place in the 19th and 20th centuries. The exact number of these whales that currently exist is unknown, but they are a species that is currently listed as being threatened. Like many other whales, these guys use their voices to communicate with one another, and that is where the sound comes from. Other than the sound that they're making, the increase in noise under the water, especially man-made noise, is actually a threat to their existence. The sound can interrupt their normal behavior and drive them away from areas that are important to their survival, and sometimes intense exposure to noise can even cause one of these whales to strand and die, which truly is just awful. Number 3. The Bell Island Boom In 1978, just off the coast of Newfoundland, a loud boom was heard. She was so loud that it shook houses and caused some damage. Some eyewitnesses claimed that they saw a ball of light and then the biggest boom they ever heard. It was as if the world stood still and then shook. No, it wasn't muttering a screech doing a jig. No one's really sure what it was, actually. However, some speculate that it may have been a weapons test by the United States or the Soviet Union. I wouldn't put it past them, too. This was the time of the Cold War. It very easily could have been a nuclear sub parked a little too close to the rock. Next time you take a dip in the water near Newfoundland, make sure you bring a Geiger counter. You never know. In our number two spot today, we have the boom, another boom. Okay, so for this one, let's start off with the sound and then we'll go from there. Do you have any guess as to what that big boom was? Apparently, that sound was caught on a hydrophone and it is coming from an underwater oil rig. You know, remember when we were talking about the man-made sound pollution of the deep sea and how it affects marine life, the whales, you know? Yeah, that is exactly the kind of thing that we were talking about. I don't have the solution on how to make it better or how to fix the problem. All I know is that it is one, and honestly, how could it not be? That sound freaked me out while I was sitting at my desk researching, so like, I couldn't imagine if that just boom just happened while I'm just chilling in the comfort of my own home at the bottom of the ocean. That sounds awful. You gotta deal with things with teeth and lights and weird stuff down there, not booms. Number one, clownfish. Today I actually learned something. Wow. Clownfish, the very same fish from the hit Pixar movie Finding Nemo. Yeah, not so charming and cute in real life. I say let's start a petition to rename the orange weirdos. To communicate with one another, to mate, and to assert dominance, or to do as the clownfish do, they make aggressive popping noises, which you can imagine being up close and personal to a reef full of these jokesters would just sound terrible, awful. The moist popcorn popping from hell. Oof. At least that's what I'm gonna call it. For everything else I talked about on this list, be careful, you never know what's out there. However, if it's one of these guys, run or swim very far away. Maybe get some earplugs. I wouldn't want to be anywhere near that anyway. Oof. Number 10, Port Royal, Jamaica. Port Royal in Jamaica used to be the most banger place on earth. It was once considered the world's best party town for pirates back in the 1600s. You know how much of a good time you have to be for pirates to collectively decide you're one of the best place to party? Pirates are maybe the best partiers of all time. However, God probably got all butthurt about this because in June of 1692, a massive earthquake hit the area, followed by a huge tsunami which buried the whole city underwater. Around 3,000 people died and the city has been left underwater to this day. This is definitely a huge bummer. It's considered an archaeological wonder, but I think we all need to pour one out for our fallen pirate brothers and sisters. We're just trying to have a colossal rager when the whole world came crashing down on them. I hope they're all up there in heaven getting tanked and rinsing puke out of their little funny mustaches. Number 9. The Gulf of Mexico Shipwreck I wouldn't want to be the captain of a boat. You have so much responsibility with all the people on board, and you don't even get to do the best things on a boat, which is take it easy and lay around the whole time. I especially wouldn't want to be the captain of a boat going through the Gulf of Mexico. There's over 2,000 shipwrecks in this area. Sailing through here is like your buddy dating someone crazy, even though you told 
told them not to do it and then big surprise they burned down their house. Well there's one shipwreck in particular that has everyone interested. It was discovered when Exxon was laying some pipe down in the gulf. It's a ship that's estimated to be over 200 years old. The mystery about this old boat is that all attempts to do extensive research on the vessel have failed. Computers break down, robots stop working, people have begun to speculate that the boat is cursed and whatever is inside it needs to remain a secret. Ooh. Number 8. Fauna Seraclium. This city was once one of the most important ports in the Mediterranean. There must have been an insane amount of spice rolling through this area. I bet the whole city smelled like the candle section in Bed Bath & Beyond. It's unknown why this amazing port got sucked into the ocean, probably another earthquake or maybe it was Godzilla climbing out of the sea and smashing it into the ocean. Either or is really possible. Over the years a ton of deep sea excavations have happened in the area and so much has been dug up. Giant statues, gold coins, lost hieroglyphs, they can all be found in this area. It seems that this city was a major hub for several different cultures to come through and make trade. It's a huge bummer to think about all the knowledge that was lost in the sinking of this city and all the spices man. Number 7. The Aegean Sea Ruins the Greeks have a crazy long history. It's full of war, politics, coups, betrayals, some magic dudes lying in the cloud somewhere. I think one of the craziest parts about Greek history is that everyone only wore sandals. I mean in every movie about ancient Greece, every person is in sandals the whole movie. Alexander the Great is like, I'm taking over your country and all the people are like, your toes are out dude, it's so disrespectful. But something even crazier than fighting war and terrible footwear is the sunken city right off the coast of Delos. It's thought to be the ancient city of Cain where the Athenians defeated the Spartans. Archaeologists call it an underwater Pompeii since there's so much history that has been preserved in this city. This city has helped archaeologists learn so much more about the ancient Greeks. Number 6. Baia we got another awesome place that ended up in a watery grave. Man I guess that's why they built Las Vegas in the middle of the desert. There's no way water could suck away anyone's good time anybody was having there. Baia was a hedonistic playground where people would come to bang and party. It would even attract the rich and famous. People like Julius Caesar had vacation homes there and would come to visit constantly. This place was basically the playboy mansion of its day. There were statues and artwork of great legends like Achilles and Odysseus but unfortunately Unfortunately, the city was blasted by the Saracens in the 8th century. And no one was ever allowed to have fun there anymore. Huge bummer. By the time the 1500s rolled around, the city was abandoned. Because what's the point of having a beachside town with no debauchery? And after centuries of volcanic activity, the city was pushed underwater. Now it's a dive site you can visit to see all the fun that was lost. Number 5. The Milky Sea. I know this one sounds super gross. The Milky Sea makes me think of a giant bowl of snot that you have to cross in order to complete some task in a video game. But this one is actually pretty cool. Popping up randomly at night, the Milky Sea is an effect caused by a ton of bioluminescent plankton in the water. This makes the sea look like it's glowing and gives off a milk effect. It kind of looks like a giant rave is going on underwater. This thing can be huge, sometimes as large as Connecticut. It's still unknown why the plankton group up like this. It could be for mating or maybe they just like to hang out. But what is known that this has been happening for centuries, back before you could explain these things through science. So sailors thought it was all magic. That would have blown some dude's mind. The ocean is glowing. Quick, cut off your pinky to satisfy the gods. Number Number 4. India's Underwater City Another city lost to sea. We can assume that this one was another party town swallowed up to make sure people keep living that pleb life. Although I can't confirm whether or not this place was an endless fiesta, I can confirm that this city is old as hell. It was discovered off the coast of Dwarka, one of the coastal cities of India. After its carbon dating, it was estimated to be around 9,500 years old. If this city is indeed that old, it can mean that the reason it ended up underwater was the melting of the ice age which happened around 10,000 years ago. This would mean that this is one of the oldest cities ever discovered. It would be 5,000 years older than the oldest Mesopotamian city ever discovered. The uncovering of the city was a major find and it could unlock secrets as to where we came from and who our ancestors are. Number 3. The Bimini Road the most famous underwater city of all time. It's said to have been the mecca of science and culture and people from all over the world would come there to learn. Well it's Atlantis of course, the apparent lost city where Aquaman is king and pops out every now and again to help the Justice League with fish related problems. Well this sunken road off the coast of the Bimini Islands in the Bahamas is said to have led to the missing metropolis. It's made of giant carved pieces of limestone that are too precise to have been formed in nature so they must have been man made. Now did they actually lead to a city? 
well I have no idea but it's safe to say that there was some sort of structure built in this area out in the middle of the ocean so who knows. Number 2 The Chinese Atlantis Number 2 The Chinese Atlantis North America isn't the only place with its own ancient sunken city underwater. China has a mystery city of its own. It was called Qi Chen and honestly everything there was going great. It wasn't a party city. It didn't need to be condemned by the gods. It wasn't Pompeii and it got hit with a natural disaster. It was actually just chilling in the open until 1959. What happened was the Chinese government wanted to build a new power dam and in order to do so they needed to sink a city. The bummer is that some of the structures in the city were over 1300 years old. It was a piece of history that got sunk for a dam. The good news is that the city is under so much water that it has been preserved and now is a scuba diving hotspot. Number 1 Atlantis of Japan Has no one ever thought of giving these places their own original names? Instead of calling everything that falls underwater Atlantis, I'm going to drop my phone in a candlelight bath and call it Atlantis of my basement apartment. This joke is even funnier because I don't have a bathtub at my place. I would have to flood my stand up shower. Definitely not as romantic. Well this city apparently fell into the ocean 2000 years ago off the coast of Yonegumijima after a massive earthquake hit. Imagine an earthquake hitting before science and you think God is shaking the world because you didn't pray 18 times every day. Now the city sits at the bottom of the ocean. Some speculate that it's just rock formations but there does seem to be a 25 meter tall pyramid at the site so I don't think that's a natural rock formation. Starting off in our number 10 spot we have Leviathan. If you're unfamiliar this is a now extinct genus of macro raptorial sperm whale. It is believed that they could weigh around 100,000 pounds and reach up to 57 feet in length and it's thought that their size is what helped repel other predators while also helping them become the predator themselves. The Leviathan also had enormous teeth, teeth that reached over a foot in length which is what gave them the title of largest bite of any tetrapod. In our number 9 spot today we have the Chronosaurus. This Cretaceous marine reptile is one that had an elongated head, a short neck and a stiff body that was propelled by not just one but two sets of fins that helped propel it through the water and through strong currents in order to capture whatever prey it was after. These guys were somewhere around 30 to 40 feet in length and they had many many long sharp conical teeth with some of them also being enlarged to be fangs. So. Yeah, I mean, what more could you want in a terrifying sea creature? Along with the fossils found of these guys, experts have been able to determine some of the stuff they ate, and it includes turtles as well as other pliosauruses, which these guys are a part of that genus, meaning they basically ate their family. In our number 8 spot today, we have the colossal squid. We've got a lot of prehistoric creatures on this list today, but for this one, we are taking a dive into our modern ocean. The colossal squid is a creature that is not to be confused with the giant squid, which is similar but slightly smaller. These guys live in the darkest coldest depths surrounding the waters of Antarctica. This creature lives up to his name as it reaches an average of 46 feet in size and weighs around 500 kilograms with the females being the largest of the species. They also have large tentacles equipped with suckers that have little razor hooks on them to better latch onto its prey so <laughs> let's hope it's not you. Its diet mainly consists of large fish such as the 7 foot Patagonia toothfish and small ones and some even consume their own kind. But they've also been known to try and consume larger prey, like sperm whales, who often have been seen with scars attributing to the battles they must have faced. Only two specimens have ever been collected, with the second being found recently in 2014. If you ever wondered where the tales of the Kraken came from, you now know. In our number 7 spot today, we have Jacolopterus. Okay, I've got three words for you. Giant sea scorpion. Yeah, this eight foot long arthropod lived in the water with its gross, two large pincers and claws, and honestly, it looks like something out of the movie Alien. These guys had segmented bodies, and they were actually the largest known arthropod to have ever existed here on Earth. They had multiple specialized limbs, and some of them even had spikes. Like, for example, their 18 inch spiked claw that was used to snatch fish that passed by. It is said that some of these guys would crawl out of the water in order to mate and sometimes shed their outer skin and all I have to say is imagine finding an 8 foot long bolt of one of these creatures on the beach right before jumping in for a swim. 
I'd swear off all water after that. No thanks. In our number six spot today, we have the Helicorprion. Okay, listen, there are many, many problems with our modern world. We could sit here talking about them all day and into next week, there are so many. But here's the thing we need to realize. Things could be so much worse. And by worse, I mean this creature could still exist. This animal existed somewhere around 250 million years ago. And while it looks more like a shark than anything else, scientists now know that it was actually a creature that is more closely related to chimeras, which are a fish that separated from the shark family about 400 million years ago. So why is this animal so scary and just terrible to look at? Well, that is due to the incredibly unsettling spiral saw formation of teeth that this creature had right on their lower jaw. Yeah, an orthodontist's dream, truly. It's also not like this creature was just born with the teeth that they had for the rest of their lives. No, of course not. They had teeth that could grow and new teeth could even form. Imagine being in the ocean and you see a huge creature swim up to you that has four spiral saws for teeth. Yeah. No thanks. In our number five spot today, we have the Mosasaurus. During the Cretaceous period, which spanned about 145 and a half to 65 and a half million years ago, there was this genus of reptiles called Mosasaurus. These guys were absolutely huge aquatic reptiles that roamed throughout the waterways here on Earth. Because of their size, they became apex predators during this time and have been estimated to have grown to be about 56 feet. At the time of their existence, it isn't exactly likely that they would have encountered any sharks that are alarmingly large like the Megalodon was, but I mean, the Cretaceous period certainly had some other massive creatures that put up some pretty stiff competition. This is, of course, like I mentioned, an entire genus, so there are definitely some less threatening species in the mix, but there are some in there who would have given the Meg a run for their money should they have existed at the same time. In our number four spot today, we have the big fin squid. Okay, the squids that live in our oceans are terrifying. There's no other way to put it. The big fin squid is not often seen, and thank goodness for that, because they are so unbelievably freaky. They they can be found in many different oceans, but they live in the permanently dark zone of the ocean around 1,219 meters or 4,000 feet deep in the sea. On November 11th, 2007, as an ROV was searching around the deep dark waters in the Gulf of Mexico, it was able to catch one of these guys on film. While there is still a ton that remains a mystery about these elusive creatures, it is believed that they can grow to be around 23 feet long or over 7 meters. The real creepy stance that these guys have is when they hold their like really long appendages perfectly perpendicular to their body, which creates like a sort of elbow look. In our number three spot today, we have the Plyziosaurus. These guys are a prehistoric creature that was massive and grew to be about 43 feet long. They had these super long necks that basically took up like half of their body. And even though they were so massive, they had no trouble moving efficiently through the water. These creatures had four flippers. So our best guess as to how they swam would be sort of like a penguin. Their front limbs did most of the work while the back ones kind of did like the steering. Fossils have been able to show us that these creatures gave birth to live young and are actually kind of similar to dolphins in the way they take care of their young. It is thought that these just may be the creatures that inspired the tales of the Loch Ness Monster. In our number two spot today, we have the Basilosaurus. These guys have a name that translates to King Lizard and they are a genus of large predatory prehistoric whales that lived during the Eocene, which is approximately 41.3 to 33.9 million years ago. These guys were actually first described described in 1834, which makes them the first prehistoric whale known to science, which is kind of cool. These guys were one of the largest, if not the largest of their time, and they were the top predators of their environment. They preyed on sharks, large fish, other marine animals, including the dolphin-like Dorudon. Really, they were able to eat basically anything that they felt like eating. These guys even had teeth that were various types, like canines and molars, which probably allowed these creatures to chew their food, which is different to their more modern ancestors. In our number one spot today, we have the Pliosaurus, another massive prehistoric creature, also not to be confused with the Plyziosaurus. These guys grew to be around 40 feet long and about the size of some of the whales we would see today. These creatures are best known for their insane hunting abilities. They could move quickly and they were quite strong. This effective predator skill set, coupled with their massive size, allowed them the ability to take down much larger prey, sometimes even dinosaurs. According to experts, these guys had exceptionally strong jaws. Some even believe that it might have had a bite just as powerful as the T-Rex, which is of course known for having one of the most powerful bites of any land animal. I'm just saying, these guys were definitely a top predator in their day. Starting off this countdown, we have Gackle Ridge. The Gackle Ridge is located in the Arctic Ocean between Greenland and Siberia. This ridge is said to be the deepest mid-ocean ridge in the world. The depths are said to go up to three miles. 
hence why it has hardly been explored. It's just way too deep for divers, especially if they're diving into the unknown. Who knows what's down there? Now, in 2003, scientists have found the first Arctic hydrothermal vents. These vents are said to contain species found nowhere else on the planet, but we haven't been able to explore them yet. I'm telling you, mermaids might be real. They're just hiding in deep areas in the sea that humans can't reach. In our ninth spot today, we have the Tonga Trench. And guys, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up because it really helps us out. So the second deepest place on Earth is said to be the Tonga Trench. This trench is located between the Pacific Plate and the Indo-Australian Plate in the South Pacific Ocean. And it's said to be over 10 kilometers deep at some points. Wow. But it could be way deeper than that. We just don't have the full ability to tell. Now, this trench is said to be home to a bunch of strange creatures. Also, during the Apollo 13 mission in 1970, they carried with them a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which was supposed to remain on the moon. But that didn't happen. And instead, it survived re-entry into Earth and crashed into the Tonga Trench. It is now just chilling there and will remain radioactive for thousands of more years. Moving on to number eight, we have the Twilight Zone Reefs. Now, I talked about these in another video, but the Twilight Zone reefs are located in the Chagos Island. They are part of the Twilight Zone in the ocean, hence their name. But there are areas of this reef that haven't been explored. This is due to a number of reasons. One, the island is very remote and hard to get to. Number two, you're only allowed to dive 25 meters down. Yeah, the island has this rule in place for divers, and I'm not really sure why. But going further than that is restricted. Now, this isn't the only coral reef which remains pretty mysterious. In fact, very few of the world's coral reefs have been studied deeper than four meters down. So who knows what's truly out there? In our seventh spot, we have the underwater cave systems. In 2018, a bunch of explorers discovered a number of underwater caverns in the Mexican Yucatan Peninsula. They are now considered the world's largest underwater cave system. Not only that, but they have found ancient Mayan artifacts down there. It's incredible. They believe that the caves are around 215 miles long, but they could be even bigger than that. They also found a bunch of unknown plant and animal species down there as well. It's gonna take us several more years before they fully map out this entire cave system, as well as explore the full thing. It just scares me that there could be like these terrifying human-eating creatures out there and we don't even know it. Moving on to number six, we have the unknown. Like I said, humans have barely explored any of the ocean. We truly don't know what's all the way down in the deepest depths. In fact, scientists think that when we do have the capability to explore the ocean more, we'll find even deeper points than the Mariana Trench. The ocean is just way too vast. It's gonna take us hundreds of more years before we even explore half of it. So basically, we don't know what places humans have never gone to because we haven't even found those places yet. There could be hundreds more underwater and caverns and new species out there. Hey, maybe the Kraken or even the Loch Ness Monster is real. It's just hiding the place we haven't explored yet. Just a little food for thought. Just, just think about it, think about it. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the deep sea vents. So the ocean floor is covered in hydrothermal vents. They are formed when seawater circulates through hot volcanic rocks. The heat then circulates into the cold water and BAM! It creates these sea vents. There's more to it, but that's just the simplified version of it. Anyways, some of these vents are so hot that they can melt your flesh off with ease. So there's a bunch of areas where humans can't go unless they want to be roasted alive. The biggest plumes out there can reach up to 18 stories tall. So, damn. No one wants to go anywhere near them. Moving on to number four, we have the Dragon's Triangle, otherwise known as the Pacific Bermuda Triangle. Now, this isn't to be confused with the main Bermuda Triangle. That's located in the Atlantic Ocean. But the Pacific has its own equivalent, which they call the Dragon's Triangle or the Devil Sea or the Pacific Bermuda Triangle. So basically, this area is blamed for the disappearance of many different ships and military vessels. In fact, it's considered one of the most dangerous marine locations around the world. As a result, no human has ever dared to dive down there and see what's up. Now, in 1950, a team of researchers did go there to see what was going on, but apparently they vanished as well. 
their bodies never found. So yeah, like I said, when stuff like that happens, no one wants to follow in their lead and go exploring. Over the years, a number of US and Japanese ships have gone missing in that area. One time, nine American ships went missing in that area in perfect weather. To this day, they haven't been found and we literally don't know what happened to them. Okay, so it's pretty freaky. What's going on there? In our third spot today, we have Point Nemo. And no, it wasn't named after the movie Finding Nemo. I was disappointed when I learned that out. But anyways, this area is said to be the most remote oceanic location in the world. It's also considered one of the world's most hard to reach places. That's due to the fact that it's so isolated from other places. The nearest land is 2,688 kilometers from it. As a result, no one really goes there. I mean, why would they if it's so far away? But rumor has it that this place is a space junk cemetery. Since no one goes there, that's just kind of where they discard of old rockets and satellites and stuff. It's said that over 100 decommissioned spacecrafts are in that area. So if someone goes diving around there, is that what they're gonna find or what? No clue, we might never know. In our second spot, we have the Challenger Deep. So at the very bottom of the Mariana Trench, there is a point called the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest point known on Earth. Now, there have been a very small number of divers that have gone or attempted to go there, but it's way too hard to stay down there for extended periods of time. Plus, they need very special diving equipment in order to do so. As with the other unexplored ocean places, we don't know much about what lives down there. But some of the fish and animals that have been found there are super creepy and weird. Like the giant tube worm. They live near the hydrothermal vents and feed off of bacteria. These tube worms can grow to be over eight feet tall. No, just no. And then the other creatures down there have evolved to survive in the high pressure low light environment. So some can't even see because they don't need to and others don't even have scales. Many are just translucent. It's pretty insane. And in our number one spot today, we have the Mariana Trench. Obviously I'm not talking about the band here, Mariana's Trench, but still Josh Ramsey is incredible. Anyways, the Mariana Trench is located in the western part of the Pacific Ocean, and it is the deepest part of the ocean. It is said to be 2,550 kilometers long and 69 kilometers wide. The exact depth though is unknown because we haven't been able to get to the bottom of it. But apparently if you take Mount Everest and put it in the trench, its summit would still be underwater by more than two kilometers. So yeah, it's hella deep. Now, there's a number of reasons as to why humans haven't gone there. Number one, light can't reach all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. After 200 meters, the light begins to decline. So it would be super hard to see down there. Not only that, but the deeper you go down, the worse the conditions get. I mean, the pressure down there is way too much for the human body to handle. Literally, it would crush a human to death. Also, the temperature drops significantly the deeper you go. So yeah, it's not the best conditions for exploration. In fact, it's easier to send a person to space than it is to send them down to the bottom of the ocean, which seems pretty unbelievable if you ask me. So yeah, we really don't know what's down there and it's quite freaky. There's probably so many different species just waiting to be found. Also, apparently I say species weird. Someone's like, it's species, 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 I don't even know what I say, okay? It's fine, I'm Canadian. <laughs> Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the first discoveries. To start off with, we are taking it back to the Renaissance era. According to accounts from the time, there were discoveries of huge triangular fossilized teeth, but at the time, these teeth were so big and they had no idea who or what they belonged to. Instead, people of the time thought that they were petrified tongues or shed teeth that belonged to snakes and dragons. I mean, with the size of these teeth, I truly do not blame people for thinking that they were proof of the existence of dragons. It wasn't until 1667 when the Danish naturalist Nicolaus Steno recognized them as the teeth of sharks, and it was then that he described his finding in the book, The Head of a Shark Dissected, which also contained an illustration of the tooth. In our number nine spot today, we have the feeding habits. Well, it's hard to learn much about the habits of a creature that has been extinct for as long as the Megalodon has, there are 
different and really interesting clues we can use to determine some of the things that were once a complete mystery to us, and one of those things has to do with their feeding habits. Of course, a creature that is slated to be as large as the Meg is going to need a lot of fuel. It's going to need a big meal, and what better large meal lives in the ocean than a whale? That's right, one of our current largest creatures was a Megalodon delicacy. You may be wondering how we were able to figure this out, and that relates back to the finding of fossilized whale bones. These bones have been found with cut marks from Megalodon teeth etched into their surface. It is said that some of these bones even have nastier wounds with the shark teeth actually still stuck in them from millions of years ago. Talk about an apex predator. In our number eight spot today, we have the bite force. One thing scientists have been able to estimate about the Megalodon is what they think might have been the force that they could bite down with. So to set the stage, we of course need something to go on unless you're already an expert in bite forces. Humans, our bite force is measured to be around 1,317 newtons. That doesn't seem too bad. Next, a great white shark, which seems to be quite the predator here currently on Earth. Their bite force is measured at about 18,216 Newtons. That's definitely quite a jump from us as humans, but it makes sense. I mean, a great white can definitely do a lot of damage should it choose to. So now we have the Megalodon, one of the most powerful predators to have ever existed, the apex predator. Scientists estimate their bite force was between 108,514 to 182,201 Newtons. A reminder that ours isn't even 1,500. It's discoveries like these that really put into perspective just how large and powerful this prehistoric creature really was. In our number seven spot today, we have so many teeth. So most of the discoveries relating to fossils of megalodons that have been found are just teeth. There's so many teeth and so little of really anything else that has been found. And that of course begs the question as to why? Well, apparently, part of this is because sharks continuously produce teeth throughout their entire lives, and depending on what they eat, they often lose their teeth. Like, apparently it's so common that they go through thousands of teeth in their lifetime. Maybe I'm new to the shark game, but I had no idea. But of course, this means that shark teeth are constantly raining down to the sea floor, only to later be discovered, and in the case of megalodons, only to become a fossil first. The other half of why the teeth are so common is because teeth are the hardest part of a shark's skeleton. Shark's bodies are made from a softer cartilage rather than bone, sort of like the stuff that our nose and ears are made of. This means that the chances of these things surviving all of these millions of years are slim to none. In our number six spot today, we have a fossil. Like I mentioned previously, it's hard to find any remains or fossils of megalodons other than teeth. Most of these remains have been lost to time, but that is exactly what makes this discovery so fascinating. A fossil found in Peru a few years ago is said to not only have been the discovery of a full set of teeth, but also a brain case and a small string of vertebrae, which is a very rare find. Aside from just being a relic from a time long past, this fossil could give us immeasurable insights into what these creatures looked like. Like, more so than we know now, and it may even be able to uncover some of the secrets that remain hidden in the past. In our number five spot today, we have their appearance. From when the existence of megalodons was first discovered up until quite recently, people believed that these sharks looked basically like a ginormous great white shark. Like most of us have seen Jaws, think of that shark. Or the 2018 classic, The Meg. That's what people assumed they looked like. Turns out, based on what we now know, that's really not the case. These sharks would have had a much shorter nose than a great white, like a sort of flattened and squished one. It also would have had longer, like extra long pectoral fins, because when you're that big, you need all of the support you can get to navigate through the water. We thought that megalodons would look like great whites because we thought that they were related, but as it turns out, that isn't true. Megalodons actually come from a different lineage of sharks, and Sadly, they were the last member of the lineage. In our number four spot today, we have ancestors. Speaking of the life and lineage of megalodons, let's take a look back at what we know about their ancestors. The oldest definitive ancestor of the meg is a 55 million year old shark called Otidas oblicus. 
These sharks grew to be about 9 meters or 30 feet long. This of course isn't where things stop though. The evolutionary history of this shark goes back to another ancestor called Cretalamna, which lived about 105 million years ago. This means that the lineage of the Megalodon spans over 100 million years. That's wild! This is part of how they found out that Megs and Great Whites weren't actually as closely related as once thought. Through more fossils that have been found, they've been able to trace this lineage, and in fact it is now believed that ancestors of Great White Sharks and the Megalodon probably lived at the same time and they were likely in competition with each other. Safe to say it would have been a pretty terrifying time to live in the ocean. In our number 3 spot today we have a cosmopolitan. One of the things that helps us to know that the Megalodon existed relates back to how widespread they once were on Earth. It is said that this species was adapted to warm tropical and subtropical waters, but that means that they could be found basically on every continent except Antarctica, and we have found the teeth to prove it. Apparently the places where most have been found include the east coast of North America, and definitely in the bottom of saltwater creeks and rivers in places like North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida. They are also said to be a common find for divers off of the coast of Morocco and in certain parts of Australia. They are even sometimes found in the UK, but this is definitely more of a rare sighting there. This is all to say that this proves to us that this was a species that was clearly thriving during their time here on Earth. It can be hard to imagine these prehistoric creatures, but in the history of our planet, they really aren't that long gone. In our number 2 spot today we have rings. One of the best preserved and most complete megalodon fossils or specimens finds its home in the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences Conservatories in Brussels. This includes a collection of 150 vertebrae that were found in the 19th century Antwerp, Belgium. When they were discovered, they weren't completely strung together, but they were found in the same layer of rock in the same location, which would make it fair to deduce that they likely came from the same animal. Using three of these vertebrae, researchers were able to find out the age and roughly the size of the shark when it passed away millions of years ago. They were able to do this because apparently on shark vertebrae they have sort of rings, like trees do. Like you can count the rings of a tree and you can apparently do that for a shark as well which will give you an estimate on their age. On this specific specimen they counted 46 circles in the vertebrae which put the shark at roughly 46 years of age. This would have been quite young for a megalodon since they are said to have lived to be about 88 to 100 years old. Having this age estimate allowed them to also estimate the potential size of this megalodon which they said was around 9.2 meters or roughly 30 feet. In our number one spot today we have Bye Bye Megalodon. To cap off this list today it only seems fair that we talk about what happened to the Megalodon. If they were these huge powerful apex predators how did they die off especially when other shark species have seemed to survive? We know that the Megalodon was extinct by the Pliocene which was 2.6 million years ago and was when the earth entered a phase of cooling. We of course can't know exactly the moment the last Megalodon died but right now it is believed that it may have been about 3.6 million years ago. The cooling of the planet is likely the biggest contributor to the demise of the Meg. I mentioned before that they preferred warm tropical waters, and a drop in those temperatures would totally throw off the habitat that they once called home. This significant habitat loss, coupled with the likelihood of their favorite prey either also going extinct or adapting to cooler waters and moving where the sharks couldn't go, truly is a recipe for disaster for the good old Meg. On. Another big contributing factor relates to when they gave birth, which is thought to have happened close to the shore, which would provide a cozy, shallow nursery for their young that was free from predators like large whales. This is all fine and dandy until ice begins to form at the poles and the sea levels dropped, which means that the safe place where they once went to have their pups was now destroyed as well. Scientists believe that up to a third of large marine animals, which includes 43% of turtles and 35% of seabirds became extinct as a result of the cooling temperatures seen millions of years ago. This affected and significantly dropped the number of organisms at the bottom of the food chain, which ends up being a huge problem for our giant apex predators. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the RMS Republic. In 1981, researchers were on a dive when they came across the wreck of the RMS Republic. This ship was built in 1903 and it ended up being lost at sea in 1909. Since 1909, there were plenty of rumors that began swirling that said the ship may have been carrying a whole bunch of treasure. Like treasure that could perhaps be worth billions of dollars. 
One of the rumors was that the ship was carrying US gold coins that would have been worth a minimum of $250,000, but there's an even crazier rumor that the ship was carrying $3 million in coins as it was supposed to be a loan to Russia. Either way, this treasure has actually never been found as it certainly wasn't with the ship when the researchers came across it. Do you guys think that there was never any treasure or do you think that someone else found it first? In our number nine spot today, we have this ancient battle gear. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far because it really helps us out. These artifacts were actually found recently after a dive in 2013. Just off the coast of Sicily, archeologists located what they believe may have been the site of the first naval battle. They found armor, weapons, helmets, and battering rams, and there were even able to date them back to around 2,000 years ago, which is so unbelievable. They believe that these artifacts are the remains of the Battle of the Agati Islands. This was when the Romans battled against the Carthaginians for over 20 years. It is believed that around 50 ships were sunk in this time, and that is how these remains ended up there for two millenniums. I don't know about you guys, but it's honestly crazy to think about that stuff still being around. In our number eight spot today, we have Dwarka. There was a time when the city of Dwarka was considered to be just a myth, so it came as quite a shock when researchers found the lost city 120 feet under the water. Testing done on the city remains has dated them back to 9,500 years ago, which could possibly place it even before the start of Egyptian and Chinese civilizations. This lost city consisted of six sectors that were each divided into residential and commercial areas. Apparently the great flood that happened 9,000 years ago is the cause for the city to end up submerged in the ocean. It's crazy that we can look back 9,000 years ago and know things like that. The name Dwarka translates from Sanskrit to mean gateway to heaven. With the city, researchers also found construction material, pottery, beads, sculptures, and even human bones and teeth. The city had many, many royal palaces that were all made with crystal and silver and had emeralds as decorations. In our number seven spot today, we have ancient medicine. Just off the coast of Tuscany, in 2013, researchers found the Relito del Pizzino, which was a shipping vessel that they were able to date back 2,000 years ago. Among the remains of the ship, they found some items that would help give them insights into what life was like for ancient Romans, and one of the most interesting items was ancient medicinal pills. Researchers believe that these pills were used as an eye medication. They contained zinc compounds, starch, iron oxide, beeswax, and some plant-based materials. This really helped give us more insights into what was considered medicine all the way back then, but I feel like there are many things we still don't know for sure. In our number six spot today, we have the Antikythera Mechanism. I spoke about this crazy artifact in another one of my videos. In the very early 1900s, researchers found an ancient computer just off of a Greek island. This mechanism remains on display at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens because it is honestly unbelievable. This analog computer may have had a ton of uses and researchers aren't 100% sure about all the ways it was used, but it is known to have been some sort of astronomical calculator. It was able to predict eclipses and different planetary placements. It was found 45 meters below the water in the wreck of a ship. This mechanism has been dated back to somewhere around 87 BC, and it is thought to have been created by a Greek scientist, but unfortunately, after the creation of this ancient computer, the knowledge of this kind of technology was lost before it was found again. I truly wonder where we would be technologically if we had never lost that kind of information. In our number five spot today, we have Gondwana. This one is hard to think of as an artifact, but I most definitely think it applies for today's list. In 2011, National Geographic published an article where they said that pieces of Gondwana may have been discovered deep in the Indian Ocean. Gondwana is the ancient continent that used to exist when Australia, India, and Antarctica were all one landmass. Apparently, they found the presence of granite and sand stone, which is unusual to find on the seabed and is much more common to continents. There isn't a ton that is known about these microcontinents, but it truly is very mysterious and very fascinating. Since these pieces were from a time when dinosaurs still roamed the earth, they have even found fossils. In our number four spot today, we have these Stone Age artifacts. Swedish divers found artifacts that they believe may have been the remnants of Swedish people all the way back from the Stone Age. These artifacts were found in the Baltic Sea and are believed to be 11,000 years old. They were found 16 meters below the water and their findings consisted of animal horns, flint tools, wood, and ropes. 
It's crazy that researchers have the ability to date these kinds of things as far back as they have with these ones. Apparently they were also pretty well preserved when found, which is a whole other mystery to me. It may seem like a small find, but every artifact can help give us insight to what life on Earth was like all those years ago. In our number three spot today, we have the Bronze Age sewn boat. 2014 saw quite an interesting archaeological discovery when the researcher Gilia Boeto revealed that they had discovered a Bronze Age sewn boat. This boat was found in a cove in Croatia and has been dated to have been wrecked in 1200 BC, which is unbelievable. The boat is made out of wood that is sewn together by ropes, roots, and willow branches. It is seven meters long and two and a half meters high, and considering the fact that it is 3,200 years old, it certainly has held up remarkably. This boat has given us at least a small glimpse into how boats were made all the way back then. Sometimes I hear about things that really leave me in awe of the things that have gone on on our earth. It's so unbelievably cool to think about. In our number two spot today, we have the Yonaguni Monument. Who would have thought that hammerhead sharks could lead to the discovery of an ancient artifact? Well, not exactly, but in the sea just off of Yunagani in Japan, there is a diving location that has a high population of hammerhead sharks, making it a large and popular attraction. In 1986, a diver in the area noticed some formation on the seabed that resembled a structure of some sort. This led to a team of scientists going on a dive to gather more information, and this is when the Yonaguni Monument was officially discovered. The monument is made out of sandstone and mudstone, but here's the mysterious thing. Scientists can't agree on its origins. There are some who believe that this is a natural formation, but there are some who swear that it is man-made. There are pretty reasonable arguments for both sides, and considering the fact that this thing is at least 10,000 years old, I guess it's fair to say that we may not have all the answers. In our number one spot today, we have Stardust. You guys, I truly don't even know what to make of this one. So apparently, 2.7 million years ago, a star exploded, and German researchers have now been able to locate pieces of it while they were drilling in the Pacific Ocean. I can't even believe that is a sentence that is true. This star was a type 2 supernova, which means that the star had to have at least 8 times the mass of the sun, and it also ejects iron 60 during the explosion. Somehow the star fragments ended up in the Pacific Ocean to be discovered in the remains of magnetic bacteria that were feasting on the iron from the star. Scientists believe it happened all that time ago because apparently iron 60 is way too young for Earth, whatever that means. Science is so crazy sometimes, you guys. All right, coming in at number 10, we have the mystery light. In 1492, Christopher Columbus was on board the Santa Maria with his crew on his first voyage to the New World. He sailed through the area we now know as the Bermuda Triangle and reported seeing fire on the horizon, despite there being no discernible land. He wrote in his diary describing the flame as a small wax candle that rose and lifted up. On investigation, they couldn't get to the bottom of what it was. In in modern times, people attribute the light to Columbus witnessing a meteor crash. Others, not so convinced. Coming in at number 9, Bruce Gurnan and the Time Warp. A lot of the Bermuda Triangle encounters happened a long time ago, or there simply aren't any key eyewitnesses to discuss their experiences. Bruce Gurnan is very much alive and kicking, and he had a very strange experience flying over the Bermuda Triangle on his way to Palm Beach in the 1970s. At the time, he was an experienced personal pilot and a grown up flying with his dad. Shortly after taking off from Andros in the Bahamas, Gernon came across a storm, so he tried to fly around it. He found a strange tunnel in the clouds and decided he's going to fly through it. Here's what he had to say about it. The airplane penetrated into the tunnel. These strange lines formed. Right. Okay, so that's what he had to say. In the tunnel, he said he had a feeling as if he was slipping through time and space. He said that when he got out of the cloud tunnel after 20 seconds, the Miami air controllers had been worried as his plane had totally disappeared off their radars. He described an electromagnetic yellow grayish fog surrounding the plane and messing with his instruments. When he emerged from the fog, he thought that he was going to be over Bimini, but air control told him that. Actually, he was flying directly over Miami Beach. What should have taken him around 80 minutes of flight time had only taken 34 minutes. He was baffled. He seems to have traveled 100 miles in just three minutes. So this is roughly 1,918 miles per hour when his plane was only capable of traveling at 200 miles per hour. Weird. Famous pilot Charles Lindbergh also reported something very similar in the area. 
weird. Coming in at number 8 we have the Ellen Austin encounter. In 1880 the Ellen Austin came across an unidentified schooner ship drifting in the Bermuda Triangle's Sargasso Sea. Now it was sailing a very weird erratic path and Captain Baker of the Aline Austin decided to trail the ship for two days just to check it wasn't a trap. After 48 hours the Ellen Austin came close to the boat and received no return signal. Captain Baker decided to send four of his men on board to investigate the ship. Weapons drawn they got no response. On investigation, they saw no signs of life, but also no signs of struggle. The only thing that seemed awry was that the entire crew were missing, and curiously, as was the ship's logbook. Finding a perfect stash of mahogany on board, the captain formed a prize crew of his most trusted men and ordered that they sailed the ship to New York. Days later, the Ellen Austin came across the very same vessel again. Now they sent out signals, and once again, it was met with no response. Again, the ship seemed to be drifting aimlessly. Captain Baker sent more men over, who found their prize crew totally absent, again without signs of a fray, and again the logbook was missing. Captain Baker's crew were freaked out, but he demanded that a small crew of new men once again try and steer the boat and its bounty to New York. It took hours of convincing as many thought that the ship was cursed, however he did manage to assemble a crew. Now that was the last anyone ever saw of the schooner or the crew ever again. They simply disappeared. Coming into number 7 we have the missing USS Cyclops. After departing Barbados on the 4th of March 1918, the USS Cyclops went missing without a trace with a crew of 309 people. The ship was carrying a whole load of manganese ore and was never seen again, leaving absolutely no trace. Now, by this point, it's a very familiar story. The incident was the single greatest loss of life in the history of the US Navy whilst not actively engaged in combat. Was the ship too heavy, or did the Bermuda Triangle pull it down to its murky depths? Coming into number 6, we have Carol A. Deering. Good old Carol was the name of a five masted schooner. She'd been afloat for three years when she was found run aground and abandoned on the 31st of January 1921, which is exactly 98 years ago on the day that I scripted this video, which is really spooky. The wreck was found in Cape Hatteras in North Carolina, but she was supposed to be sailing from Puerto Rico to Rio, right in the heart of the Bermuda Triangle. She was gonna cut straight through it. Now, no trace of the crew were ever found. Some people speculated mutiny, others say the ship may have been attacked by pirates, citing the prohibition era of the incident. Sadly, we will never know. Coming into number 5, we have the 2017 Turkish Airline incident. So this is actually very recent. In February 2017, Turkish Airlines flight TK183 encountered some strange problems as it flew over the Bermuda Triangle. It seems that the Airbus A330-200 was forced to change its direction from Havana, Cuba to Washington Deleuze Airport. The pilot and crew reported mechanical and electrical problems. Now electrical problems after what we've already heard, to me, that's just pretty interesting. Coming into number 4, this is a little bit more tin hat, we have the Lost City of Atlantis. The legend of the Lost City of Atlantis claims that the city radiated a mysterious energy that caused navigational instruments to break down, which kind of sounds like what we know from the area. Is the Lost City of Atlantis under the Bermuda Triangle? The legend of Atlantis also talks about interesting rock formations on the ocean bed. Now, these are rather like some of those located on the ocean bed in the Bahamas. These are called Bimini Rocks. Road. Some mystics believe that Atlantis lies at the very, very bottom of the murky depths, and the energy of the lost souls, the ghosts of the drowned citizens, are what are causing the disappearances and luring people to their watery depths, leaving absolutely no trace to the outside world. Honestly, I'm not sold on this one. Coming into number three, we have the alien wreckage. Discovery Channel host Daryl Miklos was filming a show whilst diving in the Caribbean using maps made by former NASA astronaut Gordon Cooper. Now, he was in search of old shipwrecks and magnetic anomalies. He was investigating what he thought might be an ancient shipwreck, but it turns out it was something else entirely. Miklos described it as a formation unlike anything he had ever seen, being far too big for a shipwreck, he also said. Now he said something which I thought was really interesting. He said, it was something that was completely different from anything that I've ever seen made by nature. This led him to speculate that actually, it might be something entirely unearthly. Miklos also found another strange object and formation all around the big puzzling object, all of which are covered in thick coral, thought to date back 
hundreds upon hundreds of years. When Miklos studied Cooper's work, he found that the astronaut believed in aliens. Now, this led to the Discovery Channel host speculating that the mysterious wreckage could be a crashed alien spaceship. Because, you know, what else? Coming into number two, we have the UFOs over the triangle. Can we explain the Bermuda Triangle with aliens? Maybe. It seems that there was a terrifying alien encounter on board the USS John F. Kennedy in the 1970s, but crew on board the ship were told by the captain to keep stumm. It seems that the ship was set to return to Virginia after two weeks in the Caribbean, and was in the middle of the ocean when the crew on deck looked up to see a large glowing sphere around 200 to 300 feet in diameter. One eyewitness said it was yellow and orange in colour, and all of the radar screens on board the boat lit up. Naval officers tried to deploy two F-4 Phantoms to to intercept the UFO, but they simply wouldn't start. Eventually, the UFO moved on days later, and as the ship was making its approach back to the USA, the captain warned the crew against speaking of the incident. This isn't the only time it's happened either. It seems Google Maps shows a UFO just outside of the triangle. Finally, coming into number one, we have the disappearance of Flight 19. Now, this is the most famed legend surrounding the Bermuda Triangle and one of the hardest to explain. It all went down on December 5th, 1945, when five TBM events. Bombers grouped as Flight 19 were flying over the Bermuda Triangle. The flight never returned to Fort Lauderdale as planned, and the worst was feared, with the general theory being that something had gone wrong and the planes had run out of fuel. As there were 14 men lost, the Navy sent out a rescue mission to search for survivors, or at least to confirm the wreck. 13 crew were set off on the Martin PBM Mariner flying boat, but that flight never made it back either. Neither wrecks have ever been found, nor have any trade of the missing people. Now, the story made international news and helped perpetuate the legend of the Bermuda Triangle. Coming up in our number 10 spot, we have the ghost shark. The ghost shark lives in the deep ocean and lives for about 30 years. It looks like a ghost, but arguably even scarier than one. It eats primarily crabs, shellfish, sea urchins, and octopus. Apparently, these fish have been around even longer than dinosaurs. Their big eyes can appear dead in the water, but glow when they are are exposed to light, giving them that ghostly look. In our number 9 spot, we have the Atlantic Wolffish. The Atlantic Wolffish kind of looks a bit like a blob with very sharp canine like teeth. So sharp that it can crush the shells of sea urchins and crabs very easily, and that is what they eat. They can live at depths of 2,000 feet, and apparently, they can produce an antifreeze that keeps their blood pumping in freezing water. This fish's overbite and general scary look definitely terrified us humans when we discovered it. In our number 8 spot, we have the red-lipped batfish. This fish is found near Peru at the depths of 10 to 249 feet. They eat small fish and small invertebrates including shrimp, crabs, worms, and mullets. They aren't good swimmers, but they use their pectoral, pelvic, and anal fins to walk on the ocean floor. Like this. <laughs> anal fins. <laughs> What? I'm five. <laughs> I wonder if whoever discovered this fish was more confused than scared to have found a fish that literally looks like it's wearing red lipstick. In our number seven spot, we have the dragonfish. The deep sea dragonfish lives about 2,000 feet below the surface and is most certainly a ferocious predator. I mean, look at their teeth. They are clearly born to be fierce. They are quite long, coming up on six and a half inches. And yes, they do have wing like fins, which is definitely why they were called dragonfish. They are also called the sea moth, which, yeah, no, <laughs> that makes them seem less cool because, you know, moths are a pain. So we're going to stick with the dragonfish. Little is known about their history thus far, which is just another reminder that the ocean is huge and we have so much more to learn. In our number six spot, we have the Dumbo octopus. I can't think of the Dumbo octopus without thinking, aww, so cute, it's like Dumbo. It has protruding ears that are like fins, and that is why it was given the name. Its fins act like propellers and propel them upwards, like so. Personally, I don't think this creature is very scary, maybe because the cute name put it in a positive light, but if you are someone that feels uncomfortable looking at a cluster of dots, don't look at its legs. I am that person, and just looking at its suction cup identical legs made me a tiny bit queasy. Apparently, there are about 15 different Dumbo octopus species, which is pretty cool. And also, they live in the depths of at least 13 
13,000 feet. They are the deepest living octopus known to man as of yet. They measure to about 8 to 12 inches and they can measure to about 6 feet high. They are quite hard to spot as they are known for their ability to camouflage. Pretty cool. In our number 5 spot we have the frilled shark. The frilled shark can live to depths of up to 5,000 feet which means they were most likely not spotted by a casual diver. This eel like shark has 6 pairs of gills that are across its throat. It usually swallows its prey whole but its 300 teeth would also guarantee that its prey would most likely not escape anyway. This fish is referred to as a living fossil as it looks so similar to its ancient ancestors. Honestly this fish looks old and worn and a little bit like a snake. Honestly it looks like it could be the demon of the sea. In some pics of this shark it looks truly terrifying and everyone including divers would be scared if they were ever to stumble across this fish. In our number 4 spot we have the giant squid. The giant squid is indeed giant. It is 40 feet long, that's about 12 meters. Yeah, this definitely scared the breath out of some diver somewhere upon its discovery. It is one of the largest animals without backbones in the world. They live at depths of 1,000 to 2,000 feet, which definitely has made them hard to study. Apparently, they also have the largest eye in the animal kingdom as their eyes are about 10 inches in diameter. They are carnivores, so they usually eat deep sea fish, young sharks, smaller squids, and humans. Just joking, but honestly, I'm sure sure if they had the opportunity to eat you, I bet you they would. In our number 3 spot we have the gulper eel. Ok guys, let's be real, a diver wouldn't be able to see most deep sea fish because well, we can't necessarily dive into the deep sea yet, <laughs> lol. However, I'm sure divers have seen them via pictures and after being captured in deep sea fishing nets, so there's that. The gulper eel is one of them that was most likely seen because of a deep sea fishing net. This fish has one large mouth and its mouth is bigger than its whole body which makes it a tad scary to look at. It usually feeds on small creations so there's really nothing to fear. It wouldn't eat you. It has a long pink fluorescent tail that helps attract prey with its light. I personally think it is quite chilling to look at and would love to know if you agree in the comments section below. In our number 2 spot we have the hatchet fish. So many scary fish, I'm gonna have to put on something funny after this like the big bang theory. My newest obsession. I know I'm late to the game, whatever, ya girl is a late bloomer. The deep sea hatchet fish basically looks like an alien with its big bulging eye. Oh and you know, it glows in the dark. Yeah, glows. Pretty cool. Which honestly makes it maybe one of the coolest fish. Cool but terrifying? It has a row of luminescent organs lining its belly. It apparently mimics daylight above which throws off predators below it. They live at depths up to 3,200 feet. They have a pretty large mouth that is tilted upward and opens wide to scoop up meals. In our number 1 spot we have the goblin shark. When this shark was discovered, surely everyone was terrified. It literally looks like a goblin trapped in a shark body. This creature is one of the most scary looking deep sea creatures that I have ever seen. Barely they can be as long as 4 meters but some hypothesize that they can be longer. They have very long snouts and protruding mouths that hold many many teeth that contribute to their scariness. They can crush their prey such as shellfish easily with their teeth. They can eat a fish whole and that is usually what their diet consists of, rat tails and dragon fishes. They can weigh up to 460 pounds. Their lifespan is quite long at 30 to 35 years. Even though it looks quite terrifying, it does have a flabby body with small fins so it can have quite sluggish movement. Coming in at number 10 we have the Thai boys and the curse of the princess. In Thailand there is a goddess by the name of Jiao Mei Nang Non which translates as reclining princess. This spirit is said to inhabit the cave and mountainside of Tam Luang. This is the exact spot, the cave where the Thai boys got stuck in June 2018 making headlines. Basically 12 boys aged between 11 and 16 all part of the Mu Pao wild boards football team went to a cave with loads of snacks and a football and were planning on celebrating a birthday. Oddly, an unexpected torrential downpour flooded the cave and the boys were trapped inside. Their coach went to look for them and also got trapped too. Now locals began thinking that the boys had been trapped at the whim of the princess spirit. Legend has it that once upon a time a beautiful princess fell in love with a stable boy and knowing that their love was forbidden, they ran away together. They hid out in the exact cave. When they heard that her father and his army were searching, 
that's when they took to the cave. Sadly though, the boy was caught and killed when he went out to find them food. When the princess found out, she stabbed herself and bled out in the cave, which is now said where her blood flows as water. While the change in weather may have come as a result of the unamused princess, it seems that she may have also helped in their rescue too. Amid the bid to free them, locals began pleading with a statue of the reclining princess outside of the cave, leaving her offerings to appease her. As we know, eventually all 12 boys and their coach were saved, was it the princess's mercy? The dive was 1450 meters deep, and actually one diver did lose his life in the rescue attempt. Coming into number 9, we have the handshake. This story had me feeling very queasy. It was shared in Real Clear Life Online magazine. The author was sharing a story of their grandfather's time working in military rescue and recovery during the Vietnamese War. They wrote, My grandpa was in the Australian Navy during the Vietnam War. They were taught to shake the hand of dead sailors when recovering the bodies to make them feel more comfortable and familiar with handling the dead. On my grandpa's first recovery dive, he shook the hand of a dead sailor and the arm came clean off the body. He had to keep his cool and bring the body back up, but still that's pretty messed up. Honestly, that is truly the stuff of nightmares. If people know that hands and arms can break off, why would they get them to shake them? Like, no, no. Coming into number 8, we have The Bends. A great Radiohead song, but a horrifying diving reality. The bends are a very real and very terrifying part of diving. Diving down to deep ocean depths puts incredible pressure on the body, and if you resurface too quickly, you can get decompression sickness, also known as the bends. Now, this can, in worst case scenarios, lead to paralysis and death. It is a tale as old as time with divers, and even now, experienced people, professionals, are still dying. All it takes is some bad calculations. In 2009, a National Geographic diver was photographing a shipwreck in Greece. Now, some say he contracted the bends as part of a ghoulish curse. The ship that he was photographing was the Titanic sister ship, the Britannic, which sank in 1916 after hitting a mine. 30 people died. I honestly think that's kind of offensive though. The poor guy just, yeah, died of decompression sickness and he was a professional. It happens. Coming in at number seven, we have the shark cage. I personally do not feel great about shark cages diving because while it would be great opportunity to see a shark up close and personal, you know, you'd also be seeing a shark up close and personal. It has to be done right and baiting rules are often abused by shark diving companies which makes it a bit unsafe. So anyway, in October 2016, diver Craig Capehart was on a shark dive expedition and got the shock of his life when a great white shark somehow ended up on the inside of the cage with him. Have a look at the footage he shot. Holy mackerel, that is one big mackerel. No shark. They're all fish, right? I actually think that the shark here is like kind of cute. He's like, boop, 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 what you doing? What you seeing? He probably doesn't understand and he just wants to know what was going on and what the people in the cage were freaking out about. But then I remember that actually he's a shark and he literally probably wanted to eat them. Let's watch that clip again, shall we? Ah, no. So much no. Coming into number six, we have the cool of the crabs. There are some truly horrifying deep diving stories on Reddit, and this one made me feel kind of ill. Responding to a Reddit AMA asking divers to share underwater stories that scared the hell out of them, Team Pterodactyl shared a horrifying visual memory. They were diving off the coast of Florence in Oregon, a spot where a surfer had gone missing just a few days before. They shared their story saying, I was diving with some friends and we found a body on the ocean floor in the creepiest condition possible. They go on to share what condition that was. They said he was the surfer who'd gone missing a few days prior. He wore a wetsuit with his legs, arms, and head exposed. Crabs had eaten the flesh from his exposed bits, so basically, he was a torso with a skull and skeletal limbs. Ugh, holy crabs, man. Anthropods are just trying to get by, but like, ugh. I honestly 
don't think I would recover from seeing that. Coming in at number 5 we have the mystery man. So the same redditor as above shared another scary diving story and I'm not sure which worries me more. This next story is about a 1am mystery diver who appeared from nowhere. They wrote, the creepiest dive of my life, two buddies of mine and I were on a night dive in the Puget Sound hunting prawns. It was around 1am and we were a good 100 feet deep, the pitchest black you could imagine. We used to do this thing on night dives where we would get in a circle and turn off our lights, then stare up the water and watch the bioluminescence float around us like floating stars in watery black space. Beautiful. Only this time, we turned off our lights, stirred up the water, and the water glows just enough to reveal a fourth person sitting in our circle. Oh my god, hello unexpected guest, I really don't like where this story is going. They continue by saying, we were at a dive resort so it wasn't so odd to see another diver, only it was 1am, we'd seen no one else prepping a dive on the dock. He was also alone, which is odd considering the dangerous conditions of a night dive in those waters, and he had on no fins and no gloves. I don't know how he swam so well without fins and didn't get hypothermia without boots or gloves. We wore dry suits because it was so cold but this dude was in a wetsuit with exposed skin and we thought we saw a giant gash in one of his legs. The story continues, they say, so the three of us all noticed him and we were too scared to move. I could hear my buddies panting in their regs and the guy just smiled and waved and then swam away. Honestly, sometimes people are the scariest water beasties of them all. Coming into number 4, I want you to understand how deep it really gets. Okay, so for some mid list context, I want to show you how deep the ocean really is. It is an utter horror show. Like I said at the start of the video, we've only explored around 5% of the ocean, so to illustrate how scary it is, I want you to have a look at this from BuzzFeed. Now I'm going to screen record this scrollathon. Okay, so. Up here is what we see and know of the ocean. Here's the free diving world record just below. But then we get deeper. Then we lose light. Things get spooky. We say goodbye to mammals. Then at 6,000 meters, things get pretty worrying. Bah, a ghoul, no. Then even further down at 11,000 meters, we get the deepest point of the ocean. Reject, decline, no thank you. I am a land lubber forever. Or like a land lubber that likes paddling in the ocean. Just like a bit. In the shark free part though. Oh. Coming in at number 3, we have the underwater ghost. Is this a picture of the first ever underwater ghost caught on camera? Well, it doesn't look like much, but let me tell you the story. This image was taken by paranormal divers. Yes, paranormal divers, because if you believe in ghosts, why wouldn't they also exist in the sea? The dive took place in a flooded underground cavern, 130 feet down, and when the team were investigating, they heard screams coming from the black water. They snapped their cameras and this is what they found. One of the dive team said, we panned deeply and shot the black water, and the sound of this screaming voice was at the exact site of a diver death. What? They continued by saying, to our knowledge, this is the first underwater ghost photo ever taken. I don't know, guys, what do you think? Coming in at number two, we have the shoes. So I recently did a video on our sister channel Life's Biggest Questions called Where Did the Bodies from the Titanic Go? And I learned a lot of really interesting things, but also a bunch of really, really sad things. The first time the Titanic wreck was explored by divers was in 1986. Movie director James Cameron made a handful of trips to the wreck when researching and filming the Titanic movie in the 90s. You would imagine that deep divers would have seen some pretty macabre stuff, right? Well. Actually, James Cameron said that bodies, even just skeletal remains, are nowhere to be seen. Thousands of people died on board though. At 12,000 feet down, skeletons dissolve very quickly under the pressure. Hauntingly though, what is left of the thousands of bodies are the pairs of shoes that they were wearing when they died, and they are absolutely everywhere. Why is this? Well, because shoes back then were treated with tannic acid, which means they're protected and less likely to dissolve in underwater conditions. Have a listen to what James Cameron had to say about it. A pair of women's shoes? Yeah. 
next to a pair of girls' shoes. These were people. These were people. Those shoes got the, to the bottom double, double. on people. So every pair of shoes serves as a grave marker where the humans fell to their final resting place and that honestly actually is a little bit more haunting than seeing a real body. Finally coming into number one, I am bringing this straight from the scariest part of the world deep deep down in Mariana's trench, we have Mariana's song. So remember that strolling adventure that we went on in the middle of this video? Well way 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 down at the bottom of that is Mariana's trench which is in the west pacific ocean and is 11,034 meters deep at its deepest spot. Now this is the deepest and in my opinion scariest place in the world. What lives down there? Well we've observed a few sea cucumbers but as there is no light whatsoever there's no saying what might lurk in the shadows. A strange unidentifiable sound was recorded coming from the trench in March 2016. Have a listen. The low part is a baleen whale that sounds at 38 hertz, but the high pitched sound is unknown. It's a whopping 8 thousand hertz. What is it? Well actually marine biologists and scientists do not know and it gives me the heebie jeebies. Mm, wanna listen again? What is it? Coming in at number 10 we have Julia. Fun fact, my sister is called Julia and she is the greatest human being in the world so shout out to Julia. Not that she ever watches my videos but just in case. So Julia is also a strange oceanic sound recorded on March 1st in the vintage year of 1999. Now this was recorded by the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. You're going to be hearing about these guys a lot in this video so as it's a bit of a mouthful I'm going to be calling them Noah for short. Noah suggested that the source of the sound was most likely to be from a large large iceberg that had run aground off Antarctica. It was loud enough to be heard over the entire equatorial pacific ocean. The sound lasted for around 15 seconds and is still a mystery today. Have a listen. What is it? Coming in at number 9 we have Train. Fun fact, Train Drops of Jupiter is mine and my sister's Julia's song, I sang it at her wedding. This spooky underwater sound sounds nothing like that song which was a happy memory. To me this is the sound of all of your worst memories and nightmares rolled into one but turned down to a volume and pitch that I would describe as medium key dread. This sound was recorded by Noah in 1997 and called Train, maybe because it sounds like a train although I'm really really not getting locomotive vibes here it's more like ghoul vibes. Maybe the sound was named after the moment there was a Dementor on the train in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban that would be pretty good movie scoring. Although that wasn't written until 1999, I don't think the movie came out until 2004 so have a listen and let me know what you think. One of my favourite comments on this video is from Fools Gold. They wrote, Brace yourself, lads, it is a ghost leviathan. Right? According to our mates Noah, this sound is actually an iceberg grounding, but who knows? I'm pretty down with the ghost leviathan theory. Coming in at number eight, we have Humpback Whale. Every time I think about humpback whales, I'm transported back to a time in my life when I used to work at the London Palladium on a production of The Wizard of Oz. Professor Marvel has a song, and like in the middle, he just randomly goes, Humpback Whale and it makes me laugh every time. I think she kind of had to be there. Anyway, humpback whales are kicking off in the ocean. They are making all kinds of sounds and they're pretty creepy. The sounds of humpback whales first really came to light in wartime as oceans are being listened to for sounds of enemy submarines, but instead they heard these ghoulish whales. Humpbacks sing songs for between 6 to 30 minutes at a time and it is so haunting. Have a listen. of a humpback whale singing to her newborn calf. I was listening to this whilst taking a sip of my coffee earlier and it was really freaky because I felt like the watery sounds were watery sounds from my own brain. 
Ooh, sloshing around in there. I'm not sure how legit this is, but I thought I would share it with you guys anyway. Now the sounds are real and the story, well, it may be fabricated, but even if it is, it totally fits the soundtrack. Coming into number seven, we have The Monster Below. A video was uploaded to YouTube in 2017 under the title World's Scariest Underwater Sound Ever. The description reads, my friend Kate and I were bored at night and we decided to go onto the deep web. We looked up how and we went on and bought whatever we needed to access. It. When we were first looking around, we found some pretty messed up stuff. We got so far in that we started hearing creepy sounds within the house. We were freaking each other out. A link came along saying something like, do not click this, something the CIA don't want you to see. Me and my friend were being rebellious teens and decided to click on it anyway. It took us to this black background site and it had all kinds of sections. One was for NASA and going down, where there was also one that said underwater. We thought we'd check out underwater. We found a sound file which is in this video. Now I'm linking it, I'm pretty scared by what I found. We decided to download it and post it to YouTube and here it is. If you find this, share it to your friends, let the world know that our government is hiding something from us. Have a listen. Okay, I'm thinking even if the link didn't come from the deep web and even if this was just like a creepypasta scary story, I have to say the sounds are pretty freaky. What is making it? In my opinion, it's a monster from the deep. Similarly freaky at number six, we have the ping. In 2016, it was reported that a pinging sound had been heard in Fury and Hecla Straits in northern Canada. It was freaking out a community and none of it. Not only were the mystery sounds ringing out through the water and heard through the hulls of boats, it is said by locals that the sound was actually driving wildlife away from the area. So what are the animals scared of? The location of the ping is usually a hot spot of bowhead whale migration, but the summer after the noise was first heard, there were absolutely no whales there. Now whales are big, so surely they wouldn't be scared of something smaller than them. Hmm. One theory is that the sound was actually being generated on purpose by Greenpeace to scare wildlife away from a popular hunting ground. Have a listen and let me know what you think. Number five, we have Iceberg, right ahead. Bob Diziak of Noah's Ocean Acoustics Program in Newport, Oregon shared the sounds and claims that these are caused by so called mega icebergs running aground. Mega icebergs are masses of ice 50 to 60 miles long, which is pretty insane. That's quite the bulk to crash into the shore. Have a listen to what that sounds like. Right? Coming into number four, a favourite of mine, we have the bloop. I love the bloop. I feel like I'm always going on about the bloop in these videos. Probably just because I really like saying bloop. I'm gonna do it again. Bloop. 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 The bloop in question was an ultra low frequency, high amplitude underwater sound heard several times by Noah in 1997. It was placed off the southern coast of South Africa and audible 5,000 kilometers away, which means it was really, really, really loud. Whales are nowhere near large enough to generate these sounds, so have a listen and tell me what you think it is. Some crazier theories out there suggest that the bloop is evidence of the sleeping Lovecraftian monster Cthulhu. Some say it's clearly the sound of mermaids. Noah believes it actually could be more sensibly the sound of ice carving or something from animal origin. The fact that this sound was heard over the entire Pacific is pretty crazy. Crazier still is that we still don't know what made the bloop. What a mystery. Coming into number three, we have a sound heard every year. We have the upsweep. The Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory began recording its sound surveillance system, SOSUS, in August 1991. This was when it picked up this very strange sound indeed. Known as the upsweep, the sound consists of a long train of narrowband upsweeping sounds of several seconds in duration each. It's kind of like a, you know, if someone took a big broom to the bottom of the ocean. Have a listen. The 
the source level is high enough to be recorded throughout the entire Pacific, which means something big is making it. Oddly, it appears seasonally, mainly between spring and autumn, but we still don't know what it is. Coming into number two, we have Mariana's Mystery. The Challenger Deep is right down there in the deepest point of the Earth's surface, the Mariana Trench, and it has recorded some ghoulish sounds, one being the ping. A fun side fact for you, I did a performance a few years ago called Mariana Trench and I was a fortune telling mermaid from the deep. Everyone's fortune that I told was like, you need to go on vacation because I just think that's good advice, right? Anyway, back to the story. In 2014, scientists heard a weird sound coming from the waters around the super super deep super super creep Mariana Trench. French. Have a listen. First, nobody, including our mates Noah, were too sure what it was, but now a team of researchers led by Oregon State University have published a study in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America that suggests the alien like sound could actually be a brand new call from a baleen whale. I love that, baleen whales just switching stuff up because they literally can. Finally, coming into number one, we have more whale drama, but this one actually kind of makes me want to cry, partly because it's so ominous but partly because it's so sad. Coming into the top spot, we have the world's loneliest whale. Aww. There's a really lonely whale out there and scientists think it might be the only one in the world. Whales chat and sing at different frequencies. For example, blue whales usually vocalize at 10 to 39 hertz ish and fin whales around 20 hertz. But this whale is communicating at 52 hertz. Now that's just higher than the lowest note of a tuba. This means that no other whales can act actually hear it. Have a listen. To be fair, this sound is actually horrifyingly ominous. It's like, I'm gonna do the whale. Mm. Mm, I can't go that low, but imagine that tube low, you know? It's like some scary movie soundtrack or something. Sadly though, for Mr. Deepwater Whale, it is the only individual emitting a whale call at this frequency. The whale has been heard every year since 1989, seasonally traveling the Pacific Northeast. That's 30 years and no love for this whale, which makes me feel sad. I'm officially starting Project Find Mr. 52 Hertz Whaler Friend. Whale friend. All right, coming in at number ten, we have the Ghost River of the Black Sea. I love a good mystery, as we all know. But riddle me this: How can a river flow underwater? That is some crazy mythical talk right there. Deep under the Black Sea, there is a river that was discovered only nine years ago, but has likely flown for hundreds of years. The river looks extremely haunting indeed, and even has trees growing beside it and a cascading waterfall. The river was found 60 meters deep and it is massive. It's 350 times greater than the UK's River Thames and 10 times bigger than Europe's biggest river, the Rhine. What's happening down there? River. Coming in at number nine, this actually makes me really sad. We have the Titanic's ghost shoes. Okay, it's time for some real talk, so brace yourselves. As we know, the Titanic infamously sank in 1912 after striking an iceberg, and 1,500 souls perished in the aftermath, mostly because there weren't enough lifeboats to save those on board. A lot of people literally went down with the ship, and they sank with it in its two halves, which are now 12,000 feet down at the bottom of the ocean. That's over two miles down. So you would expect that the ship would be absolutely littered with skeletons, and it was for a while, but not anymore. The first time the Titanic wreck was found and explored by divers was in 1986, over 70 years after it had sunk. Movie director James Cameron made a handful of trips down there to the wreck when he was researching and then filming the Titanic movie. When the movie director was asked about the macabre state of the ship, where the bodies are and such, he revealed that actually all of the corpses of the victims have disappeared. Why? Well, it seems that skeletons dissolve very quickly under pressure, and the pressure over two miles down into the sea is very, very high indeed. Hauntingly, though, while the bodies may have disintegrated, what is left is the pairs of shoes that they were wearing when they died, and they are absolutely everywhere. So why is that? It's because the shoes back then were treated with tannic acid, which has served to protect them from dissolving. Have a listen to this clip. A pair of women's shoes? Yeah. Next to a pair of girls' shoes. These were people. These were people. Those shoes got yeah, to the bottom. 
double Every pair of shoes down there serves as a haunting reminder and a grave marker for where the humans fell to their final resting place. I honestly think about the ghost shoes of the Titanic a lot. Speaking of a shipwreck, at number 8 we have the world's oldest shipwreck. That we know about, anyway. That's the kind of the beauty, right? We think that one thing's old, but then we find another thing, and we just keep on progressing. And I love life because of that. Hurrah! In 2018, divers made an incredible discovery a mile below the surface of the Black Sea. The Black Sea again, we've already heard about the Black Sea on this list. What is going on in this spooky stretch? This particular section of the ocean was just off the coast of Bulgaria, where divers discovered an ancient Greek vessel thought to date back 2,400 years. Can you even believe it? That's older than most cities in Europe. The 23 meter long boat has been preserved by a lack of oxygen on the seabed, which has meant that its mast and its rudders and all the other shippy bits are still looking decidedly shippy. Professor John Adams from the Maritime Archaeology Project said, A ship surviving intact from the classical world, lying over two kilometers down in the water, is something that I would never have believed possible. Well, believe it. Coming into number 7, we have the lost cities. There have been many cities that have been lost to the ocean. The ancient city of Atlantis is somewhat of a legend and it's never been found, but there are plenty of ancient cities that do officially lie in observable ruins. Heracleon, for example, lies off the coast of Egypt near the mouth of the famous river Nile. It was found in the year 2000 by underwater archaeologist Frank Goddo, but prior to that it was thought that, like Atlantis, the city was just a work of law. It is connected with legends of Heracles and Helen of Troy after all. Have a look at some of the ancient statues found strewn across the seabed. Honestly, how utterly haunting. Some of the artifacts have now been raised from the ocean, where they've been hidden for an entire millennia. As ocean levels rise on Earth, how many other cities will meet a similar fate? That's kind of why sustainability is such an integral focus at this point in history. So from lost cities and old ships, we have what could be the world's oldest computer. Coming into number 6, we have the mysterious Antikythera mechanism. Yay, I said it right. This ancient Greek analog computer was used to predict astronomical positions and solar eclipses. It's thought that this computer was used as a calendar with which to track the four year cycles of the old Olympic Games. The mechanism was lost for 2,200 years on the world's second oldest shipwreck. The artifact was initially discovered in 1901 when Greek sponge divers found an encrusted greenish lump, but 75 years later into its future, its true nature began to be revealed. Now we know that the artifact contained over 30 handmade cogs, and could nearly accurately track the movement of planets and constellations. The discovery goes to show that the ancient Greeks knew so much more than we thought that they did. Coming into number 5, we have Deep Sea Monsters. Ok, so we're around the middle spot on this list, so I think now is a good time to tell you that actually, nature is demented. Like, it's proper crazy down there. We discover thousands of new marine species each year, and well, as you know, the Earth is 80% water, so who knows what else is lurking down there? What we do know is that actually, the ocean is filled with an absolute horror show, an absolute lineup of monsters. Here I am bopping in to just name a few that will ruin your day. Meet the sarcastic fringe head shark. The humpback anglerfish, the northern stargazer, the vampire eel, the giant squid, the pelican eel, and of course, everyone's mate, the blobfish. I'm telling you, it's dark, cold, and creepy down there. Coming into number four, we have Mariana's Sounds. Did I say that the ocean was dark, cold, and creepy? I guess I missed out the fact that the ocean is also filled with a veritable horror score of mysterious sounds. Mariana's Trench is the name given to the deepest part of the ocean. Usual ocean depths are around two ish miles down, but mate, let me tell you this Mariana's Trench off the coast of Guam is nearly seven miles down. No! No. What do you think lives down there? Sea cucumbers and strange sounds. In 2014, scientists heard a weird pinging sound coming from the waters around the super deep super creep. That's what I'm calling Mariana's Trench from now on. Have a listen and let me know what you think this unidentified sound is. At first, 
nobody, including our mate, the NOAA, were too sure what it was. But now, a team of researchers from Oregon State University have decided that the alien-like sound could be a new call from a baleen whale. Still though, this is unconfirmed, and I don't feel good about deep sea sounds, especially when I've seen some of the horrors that live down there. Nah. Coming into number 3, we have unexploded nukes. Oh, you didn't know there were lost and discarded nuclear weapons across the world's oceans? Hate to tell you, but yeah, there are. A lot, in fact a whole host of non-nuclear but still very dangerous bombs are also hanging out unexploded in the deep. Sorry to ruin your day. One fun example, in December 1965, a plane carrying a Megatron nuclear warhead rolled, yes rolled, off the deck of an aircraft carrier into the Sea of Japan, where it stays forevermore. Or until it surfaces. There is a 30 kilotron fat man in the Pacific somewhere too. But Rebecca, this is a list about found things, not lost things. Sure, sure, sure. But I'm saying one day they will turn up. Maybe in a sleepy seaside village near you. A big boy bomb washed up in North Carolina in November 2018. That beast was from World War II, 70 plus years, and she found her way to the shore. Honestly, the thought terrifies me. Coming into number two, we have the spaceship of the Baltic Sea. Some call it the Baltic Sea Anomaly, others call it a crash landed UFO that sunk to the bottom of the ocean, and some people think it is the spit of the Millennium Falcon. In 2014, an image of the strange object was circulated by professional divers. It seems that the mysterious object is raised 13 feet above the seabed and is surrounded by a very mysterious rock formation. What is it? Well, the website Snopes thinks that it's a big fat fake, but others aren't so sure. Finally, coming into number one of our scariest things found in the ocean, we have 100 plus years of human waste. Many of us have seen the tragic videos of wildlife caught up in human trash dumped in the ocean or the plastic straw in the crying turtle's nose, but actually this horrifying stuff is really just the tip of the iceberg. It seems like we have a disconnect about where our trash goes. When you throw something away we just forget about it because it isn't our responsibility anymore, but actually it doesn't mean that that thing stops existing. It is estimated that by the year 2050 there will be as much plastic in the ocean by weight as there is marine life, which is actually mental. Ocean pollution is a real issue. Some of our waste has been lost to the deep sea, some of it is still floating on the top of the ocean. Have a look at this shocking image of plastic floating in the Caribbean. More facts for you, 5 trillion pieces of microplastics are currently in the ocean, with one whole truckload added each minute. Jack Finch as well as Che and I were talking about how disgusting the throwaway culture we live in is today, but luckily there are apps like Buns that are looking to tackle the issues and encouraging us to trade things that we don't want anymore rather than throwing them away. But of course we need to be more aware of things like non-recyclable coffee cups and plastic bottles, if not we're literally going to poison our water, and like, to put it lightly, that would suck. Number 10, Socotra Island. Socotra Island has been surrounded by mysteries and myths since the time it was discovered. Between the Horn of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, the legends of the island date back all the way to ancient times. The reason it's so often spoken about is due to the strange abnormalities on the island. It's weird, and people like that stuff. That's why you're here. It is full of flora and fauna that don't exist anywhere else in the world. One of the most iconic trees is something called the dragon's blood tree. It kind of looks like somebody took like a evergreen tree and like shh, gathered all the pins and needles to the top and it's all veiny. It's so weird. Mysterious mists and bleach white sand flow over the isolated island in ways no one can explain. The island is also host to a wealthy collection of spiders, no thank you, reptiles and birds, many of which are native and endemic to the island. It certainly is like no other place on earth with many secrets still yet untold. Number 9, Siphonophore. We know that there are some pretty gnarly creatures that live in the big blue, and adding to that list, we have the Siphonophore. Check out this guy. Oh, how cool. What? I mean, oh my gosh. 
This creature was discovered 2,000 feet below the Indian Ocean by a robot exploring a canyon. At first glance, it kind of looks like a piece of trash, maybe like a toilet brush attached to like a plastic bag or several. It has many working parts, all with a different job. It can even glow if it wants to. Some parts of its body can catch prey, digest food, reproduce, and others, of course, swim. Busy dudes. They can grow up to lengths of 40 meters, which is longer than a blue whale, which, by the way, is Earth's biggest animal. However, in terms of width, it's only about as wide as a broomstick. What's even crazier is that in 2020, the year when the world shut down, scientists still discovered the longest version, 150 meters, making it the longest creature ever discovered. Number eight, Mahabalipuram. The early life of Mahabalipuram is shrouded in mystery. Though it was once part of the Pallava dynasty that ruled over part of southern India between the 3rd and 9th centuries AD. But prior to this, legends allude to the first King Bali, Mahabali, a sacrificed himself to the fifth avatar of Vishnu, after which he became enlightened. Based on discoveries made by excavators, this spot was really active in the trade of goods and other artifacts, even having trade with the Romans. It was a hub of culture, art, and literature literature full of thriving life. One of the biggest attractions was the complex series of temples called the Seven Pagodas of Mahabalipuram. However, today, only one of the seven can still be seen as the others are submerged underwater. Other legends say that the god Indra became jealous of the architectural elegance and caused flooding in order to submerge the city, which may very well be the reason it's beneath the waves today, due to the wrath of the gods. Number seven, a mysterious chest. Where'd my scarf go? It's in the chest. It's in the ocean. Beneath the waves in the swell of the Indian Ocean, there is a mysterious chest that could contain treasure for all humanity. Or evil. Who knows? Underwater snaps of the chest show that it belongs to a cargo ship from the 1800s. The trunk was discovered during a search for the missing MH370 flight that went missing, but they found two shipwrecks instead, so they're like, wow, shipwrecks, not people. At first, they got really excited when they came across the debris field, thinking that they had finally found the missing craft. But then they found out they were pirate ships and they're like, wow, exciting. Even more mysterious though is that the WA Maritime Museum has no records of the ships, thinking that it may have been a ship lost at sea and everybody died on board. However, whatever is in the chest remains to be seen and the search for the missing plane continues. Number six, the oldest tsunami victims. Over a thousand years ago on the east coast of Africa, there was a Swahili fishing village bustling and busy along their day. But then all of a sudden, a tsunami devastated the village. Based on findings published in National Geographic revealed a macabre discovery. They found a site in Tanzania that is the first and oldest tsunami deposit bearing human remains found in East Africa. The oldest human remains in a tsunami deposit was also found in the Indian Ocean just across the way in Papua New Guinea and is 7,000 years old. However, this tsunami doesn't appear to have been that big. But I mean, a tsunami is a tsunami, you know? It's a big deal, either way. But because the people live so close to the ocean and they were on the other side of it, they would have had no warning. No earthquake to hear that it was coming. So, poor guys. Number five, the lost city of Krishna. For all the Atlantis fans out there, sadly it wasn't that. But just because it wasn't doesn't mean it wasn't, I don't know, cool. In my opinion, it's cooler because it's real. For a long time, people in India considered Laura Krishna's city of Dwarka a myth, until all of a sudden, it wasn't. Indian scientists finally discovered the lost city had been submerged off the northwestern coast of India. It is now one of the best studied underwater sites and has become a famous attraction. It is even considered one of the four dharmas, a sacred place of pilgrimage and worship. Lord Krishna founded the holy city and numerous stone structures still remain. Research suggests that it used to be the busiest port town before it sunk beneath the waves over four to 5,000 years ago. Number four, the Gondwana pieces. A mysterious ancient continent called Gondwana was discovered in the Indian Ocean and scientists were stoked. It was an ancient supercontinent formed over 500 million years ago. It broke up about 180 million years ago into the land masses that make up Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica, the Indian subcontinent, and the Arabian Peninsula. Researchers are only discovering that there were microcontinents beneath basalt rocks when they found fossils. They were like, whoa, wait, animals used to live here? What is this thing? This discovery could mean that previously established beliefs about how the plate tectonics broke apart could be shattered, just like the continent was over hundreds of millions of years ago. Number three, a transformer. I feel like the ocean is a perfect spot for aliens to vacation. You know, like why not? Tons of scenery, plenty of food, opportunity to pull pranks on humans. Why the heck not? It's perfect. So when this was discovered, everyone was shocked, except for me, because I don't know if I can be surprised on this channel anymore. When a new species turns up, the first thing the world says, it's aliens. 
ends, but this very well may be a new creature in the crazy world that lives beneath the waves. However, you have to admit the footage is pretty bizarre. It looks like a creature is literally transforming itself 3,700 feet below. Check out this clip. At 45 seconds in, it just looks like it's having a grand old time floating, like wee. I'm going down. And then at 1 minute and 28 seconds in, it completely flips over and these little stripes of light reflect on its head. To me, it kind of looks like they are machine lights. It becomes more active and starts swimming around the craft almost as if it's teasing them. I don't know, friends. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. New octopus or alien friends? Both. Number two, Diego Garcia. Now, I know this wasn't technically recovered, but it sure is terrifying. The island of Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean has a murky and mystery past that the CIA doesn't like to talk about. It may have been their secret prison where they tormented their captives. The US government has persistently denied claims that it operated a secret war on terror within the confines of the island. But that wouldn't be the first time or last time they lied about something. A Swiss senator by the name of Dick Martin Marty was the one who produced a detailed report alleging the torment that happened on the island. Marty told the European Parliament, We have received concurring confirmations that United States agencies have used Diego Garcia, which is the international legal responsibility of the UK, in the processing of high value detainees. Processing was in quotations, so you can only imagine what that was hinting at. Number one, a mysterious glow. The Milky Sea has been a phenomenon for ages, but as of yet, no one has quite been able to explain it. Jules Verne even wrote about the Milky Sea in his famous novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. The legend of the Milky Sea became just that when sailors would come in from sailing. They'd be like, whoa, did you check out this weird sea that we came across? It was crazy. But they'd be like, dude, you're nuts. Even in modern times, scientists dismissed it because the level of bacteria needed to create that would be colossal and they considered that impossible. Yet it exists. Essentially, it's a glowing part of the Indian Ocean with an unknown source which remains under debate. The leading theory is that it has to do with a large collective of bioluminescent fish plankton hanging about. The reason it was proven was that Steve Miller checked a British merchant vessel that reported seeing it in January 25th, 1995. And I quote, On a clear moonless night while 150 nautical miles east of the Somalian coast, a whitish glow was observed on the horizon and, after 15 minutes of steaming, the ship was completely surrounded by a sea of milky white color. It appeared as though the ship was sailing over a field of snow or gliding over the clouds. Miller used the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, DMSP, and its polar orbiting satellites to detect this ethereal event. He matched the coordinates recorded by the ship to the date, and then he found it when he actually just waited and watched for it. The glowing spot spanned 15,400 kilometers of glowing Indian Ocean for three nights in January. Starting off this countdown, we have the Sea Monster. What you just heard is a noise no one knows much about. Seriously, researchers don't know what it's from. I don't know about you, but it sounded like a deep growl. For sure, that is the sound from some massive sea monster. It literally sounds like some evil creature cackling away or something like that. All I know is that I don't like the sound of that and I never want to encounter this creature. Now, because of the power and loudness of the sound, it can be assumed that whatever is making that sound is quite massive. But today we have the lonely whale. This sound was first recorded in 1989 by an American military network listening for nuclear submarines. Instead, they captured this audio. It's of a blue whale with a weird high voice with the main notes at a frequency of 52 hertz, a low bass note to human ears. To compare, most blue whales have a frequency between 10 to 40 hertz. So this whale has a very weak voice, but because of its voice, it can't communicate with the other blue whales. Hence why it's been given the name, the world's loneliest whale, because it's just swimming around trying to make friends, but he can't call to them properly. Like, that broke my heart. Like, listen to this audio again. It literally sounds like this whale is crying out for help. Coming in at number eight, we 
have the Challenger Deep Moans. And if you guys are liking this video so far, then make sure you smash that like button because it really helps us out. So at the very bottom of Mariana's Trench, there is a point called the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest point known on Earth. Since it is so deep, it's been pretty hard to explore, so we really don't know what's down there. But in March of 2016, a recording picked up some very creepy low moans coming from down there. Basically, to even get this recording was a struggle. The microphone was encased in titanium and was slowly lowered down so it wouldn't be crushed by the pressure. It took them 23 days to get the microphone to the deepest point down there. Then that's finally when they picked up this. Again, the sound of a massive sea creature that we haven't discovered yet, or at least that's what it sounds like, honestly. In our seventh spot today, we have Julia. On March 1st, 1999, a weird sound was recorded by the National Oceanic and Atmosphere Administration. The sound lasted for about 15 seconds and sounds like someone whining or cooing. Now, I don't know why they named it Julia. Like when I first listened to the clip, I was trying to hear someone say like, Julia, but I'm stupid. That's just the name that they gave to the sound. Could it be any more confusing? Anyways, the sound itself sounds like a sea monster moaning. People were taken aback by the sound because of how loud it was. To this day, researchers don't 100% know for sure what made that noise. But their theory is that it was just an iceberg running into the sea floor. Not as spooky, I know. Let's stick with Sea Monster. In our sixth spot today, we have the Aquatic Choirs. This is unfortunately the only sound that I couldn't find an actual recording of. But scientists in Australia have discovered that many different fish sing together at dawn and dusk, much like how birds do and then they wake you up in the morning and you're really cranky. Anyways, researchers from Curtin University in Perth started recording the sound that a number of fish make. Most of the sounds were from a single fish repeating the same call over and over again. But when two or more fish of the same kind joined in, the sounds would overlap and basically would sound like someone was humming or singing underwater. In fact, they discovered that the black jewelfish made a ba 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 sound. I think it's more like a there you go, that's, that's my impression of the black jewelfish. Either way, hearing that underwater would trip anyone out. Like imagine you're swimming off and you hear that, you're like, yo, who's there? It's just a fish playing games, but still. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the train. This noise was given the name the train because it literally sounds like a train chugging by and blowing its whistle underwater. in 1997 by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They believe that the sound came from Antarctica's Ross Sea. So they think it's from icebergs dragging along the ocean floor. But it's still strange how it literally sounds like a train whistling. All aboard the Underwater Express. Moving on to number four, we have the bloop. sound is probably one of the most famous ocean sounds ever recorded. In 1997, a large ultra low frequency sound was detected in the South Pacific. The sound only lasted for about a minute, but since then it was heard on a number of different occasions that summer, but has not been heard again since. Take a listen. This sound is very powerful and extremely loud. I mean, the hydrophone that picked up the sound was more than 3,219 kilometers away, and it managed to pick that sound up. That's crazy. Researchers have said that if it did come from a mammal, it would be a mammal larger than a blue whale. So people are thinking that it was a massive sea monster releasing an air bubble or something. 
Not only that, but the area where the sound originated from is close to the place where H.P. Lovecraft said his fictional character Cthulhu lives. So like, what the hell? Is Cthulhu real and he made that sound or what? Moving on to number three, we have the Devil's Cauldron. The Devil's Cauldron is a geothermal location in Nevada. There's a lot of legends in the area saying that this place is extremely haunted and cursed. Well, one man decided to see what the heck was up with the Devil's Cauldron and to do some investigating of his own. So he placed an iPhone 11 in the cauldron and recorded to see what it would pick up. He managed to record what sounds like screams coming from within. Surely, he was not expecting to capture that. What makes this even scarier is how berserk the phone went after capturing these screams. As a result, some people think that this spot is the portal to the underworld or something crazy like that. Moving on to number two, we have the upsweep. This is an unidentified sound that has been detected by hydrophones since 1991. Does that not sound like it's part of a horror movie soundtrack? Like I instantly got chills listening to that. It for sure is like a warning sound that something bad is approaching. What's even freakier is that when it's sped up, it literally sounds like warning sirens. It's creepy. And like a bunch of sounds on this list, we don't know what's causing it. Theory goes that it might have to do with undersea volcanic activity, but scientists don't know for sure yet. And in our number one spot today, we have the strange humming. Dude, this next audio recording literally gave me the heebie-jeebies. So you know in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, how he goes underwater to save his friends and you hear those creepy little mermaid creature things humming? Dude, that's exactly what this sounds like. Take a listen. That's for sure the sound of a mermaid humming. For sure. To this day, researchers don't know what caused the sound, because it's a mermaid. But they do think it's coming from some sort of organism. They just don't know which one. To this day, no known marine creature has been matched with that noise. Meaning it's probably from a creature we haven't discovered yet. <laughs> Mermaids, just saying. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the demon. There are many stories and alleged sightings of what is now referred to as the Black Demon of Cortez, which is said to be a massive black shark seen off of Mexico's Baja coast. One story in particular regarding this elusive shark comes from a fisherman named Eric Mack. He had reported that one day while sailing, he felt his boat begin to rock, which immediately gave him the feeling something was awry. Eric was even further startled when he explained that he saw a massive towering tail sticking at least five feet out of the water. The stories of this shark are so infamous that it was even the focus of an episode of a History Channel show called Monster Quest. Maybe if there's a part two of this video, we'll talk about some more of the sightings around the demon. In our number nine spot today, we have the prehistoric monster. Back in 1959, a fisherman named Tex Geds and his friend James Gavin were boating somewhere just off of the coast of Scotland. It is said that during their time out to sea, they encountered a sea monster that neither of them had ever seen before. They described its head as being sort of turtle shaped and that it was a quote hellish monster of prehistoric times and said that it was breathing heavily through a quote large red gash of a mouth. 
Okay, not exactly a kind description, but definitely a bit of a terrifying one. I think it's important to bring up that we actually don't really know what Megalodons look like. We have a sort of idea, but at the end of the day, we only have what, some fossils, jaws, spines, teeth. It doesn't really leave us that much to work with. While it isn't quite clear what these two men saw for sure, and it's likely that we'll never know, whatever it was definitely wasn't just the average sea creature. In our number eight spot today, we have the TikTok shark. In May of last year, someone on TikTok called Alex Albrecht, who is a marine biodiversity student as well as a musician, shared a video on the app that had people seriously shocked. The TikTok shows a massive shark lurking around the ship that Alex was on, which is said to have been just off of the coast of Massachusetts at the time. The ship was full of research students when this massive shark made its appearance, many of which either screamed or had some sort of expletive in response. Another TikTok user asked in the comments if the shark in the video is a megalodon, considering how absolutely huge the thing was. Was this an actual megalodon? Likely not, but hey, I'm not the marine biodiversity student here, so who am I to say? In our number seven spot today, we have snorkeling. Robert Pamperin and a friend, Gerald Lair, were snorkeling off of La Jolla Cove in California in 1959 when Robert was attacked by a shark. It is said to have all happened quite quickly and Gerald was alerted to the distress when he heard Robert scream. Gerald turned and saw Robert unusually high in the water and his mask was missing. At this point, Gerald dove under and this is when he realized exactly what was going on. There was a shark that had Robert in its mouth up to his waist. Unfortunately, there really wasn't much that Gerald could do to stand up to this absolutely massive shark that he described as larger than your average great white. Robert sadly did not survive the event, and by the time rescuers arrived, they were only able to locate one of his fins. In our number six spot today, we have the photographer. This is an encounter that occurred just last year in November, basically a year ago. Underwater photographer Darren Verbeck was diving off of the coast of Hawaii's Big Island when he saw what he thought was a school of fish. He began to get closer, I mean the whole photographer thing, and as he got closer he started to think that what he was actually seeing was a tiger shark. He got even closer and that's when he said, quote, I kept looking at the head. I'm like, that is not a tiger shark. And it got closer and closer and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. Darren continued to get closer to the shark and estimated it to be over 15 feet, which is definitely quite large. He explained that the shark was not acting in a threatening way, so he continued to take his photos and shot as much as he could before the massive shark decided to swim away. Experts explained that the shark was likely in the area because of humpback whales, and honestly, I don't want to see the shark that could take down one of those beasts. In our number five spot today, we have Deep Blue. This shark is, in fact, not a megalodon. I'll just be honest about that, but it definitely is a more modern contender. Deep Blue is the name of a great white shark who is most definitely one of the largest ever recorded, at least in our lifetime. This colossal monster is the largest great white shark ever caught on camera by scientists. She is measured to be 20 feet long, 8 feet high, and about 2.5 tons. And while this isn't all that huge compared to her massive prehistoric cousin, it certainly is no small feat. Rumors of her existence have been spread since as far back as the 1990s, but it wasn't until 2014 that she was officially caught on camera and documented. Researchers at the time were in the midst of studying tiger sharks, but she made her grand appearance after scavenging some food from a sperm whale carcass nearby. In our number 4 spot today, we have the USS Indianapolis. This is a story that has been considered the worst shark attack in history, which is definitely a horrific thing to think about. In 1945, the USS Indianapolis was an unescorted US warship that was sailing in the Pacific when it was struck by a Japanese torpedo. This had no problem tearing the ship in two, which then meant that 900 sailors were now floating in the ocean waiting for rescue. Over the next five days, nearly 600 men lost their lives due to shark attacks. That's either a group of sharks or a few very large very hungry ones. From the survivors' accounts of what happened over the course of those days, it seemed like an absolutely nightmare situation. This is exactly why it has gone on to be called one of the worst shark attacks in history. In our number three spot today, we have Rodney Fox. Rodney Fox is a man who is thought of as one of the best spear fishermen in the world. In 1963, he was partaking in the Australian Spear Fishing Championships, which were being held just south of Adelaide, when he went through what is widely regarded
regarded as, again, one of the worst shark attacks in history. The shark he encountered bit him around the waist, which ended up puncturing his diaphragm, ripping his lungs, and crushing his rib cage. Not only this, but the attack left his organs exposed, so much so that when he finally made it back to shore, those rescuing him had to keep his wetsuit on to ensure that his insides actually stayed on the inside. Despite the fact that Rodney needed at least four hours of surgery and about 400 stitches, like many people who have had these sort of terrifying encounters, rather than shying away from sharks in the water, he leaned in. He actually became an advocate for sharks after this. He created the first underwater shark observatory and helped to dispel the rumors that sharks are bad, crazy, scary animals that we should all fear. In our number two spot today, we have the Jersey Shore. Back in 1916, during the summer season, there were five different shark attacks that occurred over the span of 10 days that ended up in the deaths of four people. This wasn't something that had been seen before in the area, which of course left people speculating as to why this was happening. There was a heat wave in the area during the time, which likely led to more people being out, enjoying summertime sort of activities, and maybe this attracted the shark, but in the end, no one knows for sure because no one even knows what kind of shark is responsible for the attacks in the first place. Luckily, this didn't go on to become a continuous trend and whatever shark this was, it went on its merry way or perhaps found another source of food, but this series of attacks definitely kept the public on edge for the weeks and months surrounding. In our number one spot today, we have Watson and the shark. For this one, we are headed all the way back to 1749 with a cabin boy named Brooke Watson. Brooke was swimming in the Havana Harbor when he had his encounter with a shark. Shark. This one grabbed him by his right foot and dragged him underwater. The shark got a second chomp on his foot before a rescue boat was able to come and save him. The sailor on the boat managed to get the shark to back off enough that they could get Brooke out of the water. Brooke lost his lower leg, but his life was saved, which is absolutely the most important part. Brooke's story is not over, however, as he went on to become a member of parliament and eventually Lord Mayor of England. He was so proud of himself for not only surviving a shark attack, but then going on to earn this title that he commissioned famous artists. Artist John Singleton Copley to create a painting called Watson and the Shark, which detailed his terrifying encounter and probably went on to scare a ton of people at the time. Mm -hmm. 